All right, so it's 10 o'clock and we will start now. We've still got people trickling in. It's a bit of a slow day today, but um, yes, I hope they're all coming a bit later. Maybe everyone's still getting used to the MCO perhaps. Um, okay, so very good morning and welcome to the 25th edition of the Tuesday Talk Live by Place Borneo. Uh, this is special, uh, well, because it's a 25th edition, that's what a silver anniversary people would say, right? Um, but also because when we first started this, this was a platform for us to exchange ideas, uh, information and solutions where, you know, in a, in a situation where you need a lot of solutions and you need to bounce ideas off each other. And when we started it, it was during a lockdown last year and now um, we're back uh, in a lockdown well um and i'm not complaining because i think if it is a necessary step we need to prolong it so be it um, as long as we flatten the curve um so i hope that everyone is safe at home and don't go out if you don't have to you know practice uh, self hygiene and all that um and do take care my name is Mona Abdul Manap and I will be your host for today. And uh, today's topic is a very, very interesting one because I think it requires urgent attention and action. Young leaders in politics, can we create change? So I've got a, a few speakers here that I'm gonna introduce, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, later. Um, before that, I'm just gonna give you an, uh, uh, sort of an idea of um, what we have right now here in Malaysia. So we've got youth representation in parliament of only at 12%. So we've got about 200 plus MPs um, and we only got about 12% of youth. That's not far uh, behind the world standard, which is about only 14%. But now the, the thing here is our median age for people in a country is 28.6 years old. So this means that half more than half the population is below 30 years old. So a lack of parliamentary presence to represent this group of people will cause the voices of youth to be less effective when arguing for more attention on issues that they feel important for them. And at the end of the day, they are going to actually um, uh, be suffering or be part of the consequence of these decisions. So they need to have a say. Now, do we have enough uh, of their representation in the parliament? So when they don't have enough, many of them tend to believe that their voices are not being heard, or if it's being heard, um, they're not taken seriously because they're just, you know, young people. So it becomes a circular problem because then when they're not heard, then they get disengaged and disenfranchised with politics and they don't vote. So then the voters, um, the politicians or the leaders will think of them as someone not important for them to engage because these are not their voters, right? So it becomes a very vicious cycle where people don't give their feedback and then the leaders don't want them, um, don't want their feedback. But now there's another one here is by the time the 13th general ele election came out, there was an influx of about 2.6 million youth um, who actually registered as first-time voters. So this means that they are interested in getting their voices heard. They want to actually have a say in the change in our country. Um, but do we have enough leaders that can actually listen to them and listen to them and understand what they're trying to say? So a lot of decision-making that we have in our country right now, we need to have uh, people who are actually in touch with the youth, um, who are not far removed from the youth and don't understand where they're coming from. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So we've got a few of us, a few very important young leaders, I would say, um, in this movement of change uh, for our country. And I will be introducing them shortly. Before that, just the usual uh, housekeeping notes. If those of you on Zoom, you can put your questions uh, on the Q&A option at the bottom of the page. And those of you on YouTube, just type them on the chat box and we'll be able to pick it up. Uh, later and so keep them coming because we're not going to keep them to the end of the show um, we're just going to go on and pick them up as, as we go along now i'd like to introduce our speaker i'm very honored to have uh, with us yb dr kelvin Yi. he is the member of parliament for banda kuching constituency he is from the democratic action party dap um, he also chairs the health science and innovation uh, select committee 
Let me just uh, remove this uh, scene. Yep. And um, he has also been on multiple humanitarian missions all around Asia, including Myanmar, the Philippines, India, Indonesia, Thailand, and of course, in our very own country, Malaysia. So you can see where his passion lies. So welcome to the, the show, Kelvin, or Dr. Kelvin, or YB. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us. Yep. Um, the next uh, speaker, we've got Kira Yusri. Uh, actually, I've seen her a few of her tweets or on Twitter, in fact, and I like the name Tatar Kira uh, because of her name Kira, right? Um, so she is the co-founder and education director for Undi 18, so Undi 18. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Undi 18 is the Malaysian youth movement that successfully advocated for the amendment of the Article 119, bracket 1 of the federal constitution to reduce the minimum voting age in Malaysia from 21 to 18 years old. So that's something very, very uh, successful that they've done. So Kira was previously a member of the National Youth Consultative Council um, and has received a few uh, recognition for her work, uh, including being nominated for the International Woman um, of Courage Award by the US Embassy. Fantastic. And um, with Undi Lapamblas, she leads the voter education initiatives by creating uh, workshop modules and creative content to ensure that by GE15, Malaysian youth are prepared to vote. So you know what you're voting for, you know um, who to vote and what's happening around you. So welcome to the show, uh, Kira. And um, we've got Tarma. Uh, Tarma Pillai, uh, who is also the co-founder and advocacy director of Undi Lapamblas. He is the managing director of Reimagine Now and uh, the executive director of NGO Hub Asia. Uh, he was formerly an appointee also of the National Youth Consultative Council and the Senate Reform Committee. He's also an author. Hmm, interesting. And um, he's got published books such as Letters to Home and the Asrama Anthology. Now, this is the most interesting part. He was recently listed in Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia 2021. Wow, you know, I can't be, I'm no more under 30, so I can't be on that anymore. Uh, so well done on that and welcome to the show, Tarma. And um, right, as usual, I'm just going to uh, allow the speakers a couple of minutes for them to do a bit of introduction and then we'll head right on to the uh, questions that I have already. In the meantime, please get your questions and if you want to pick their brains and you can just type your questions. And so I'm going to start with Kelvin. Go ahead, Kelvin. Hi, good morning, Mona. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, of course, it's such an honor to be in the same panel as uh, Kira and Tama, who I really look up to. I really wish when I was their age, I was doing the things that they're doing. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, hi guys, my name is Kelvin. Please call me Kelvin. No YB, no doctor. I don't like formalities. Uh, but I'm I'm currently the member of parliament for Banda Kuching. Uh, I'm born and bred in Kuching. So those from Sarawak, I'm uh, and also Kuching. I'm a, I went to St Joseph School. Mm. Uh, it is a boys' school. So um, <laughs> see, Mona is laughing because she knows the history between us. <laughs> Schools in Europe. So I'm looking forward for your questions and uh, I, I've been in this is my first term as an MP. I was first elected in 2018. Before that, um, I was uh, I was working as a doctor. I did my master's. I was, just, I was uh, my heart was really for helping people in, in, in missions and also providing uh, good quality health care to those, especially the downtrodden and also the poor. So I think that's what in a nutshell, spark me to doing what I'm doing. So I'd love to hear from you guys and to learn from each and one of you. Back to you, Mona. Thank you, Kelvin. All right, next up, um, Kira, go ahead. Sure, uh, thanks so much for uh, inviting me and Dharma uh, for this session. I think just a brief uh, introduction into the topic. I think uh, Undi 18 was born out of the necessity to empower young people uh, in the current climate, uh, considering there's so much of political turbulence that's happening, not just in Malaysia, but around the world, right? Um, and we'll probably talk about it more later as well, because uh, it was a reflection of the times that uh, Dharma and I were, win, er, were in as university students. But I think most importantly that, you know, I hope that, um, you know, this, today's discussion and probably future discussions would have is that looking how does our identities play into the role of political advocacy? Um, you know, when it comes to representation, when it comes to policies, there are many factors that go into um, these areas. And it's important to take into consideration all of these different layers of identity that makes us 
up as Malaysians uh, that play a role in the policies, you know. And I think personally, uh, um, you know, I have a huge interest in uh, seeing women, young women especially, being represented on a national scale, um, you know. So that's primarily uh, the work that I do lies in how do we provide a platform and avenue for young people to learn politics and to experience politics in a safe manner. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, Tarma, go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the invite. Um, I, I think for for me, I'm I'm particularly interested in uh, in in seeing how young people uh, and especially communities can build their own initiatives to solve problems, to advocate for change, and to ensure that things are solved or problems are solved uh, within their own communities and also the country. Uh, as a whole. And I think that was the inspiration uh, that we used to start off with the 18, as uh, Kira rightly mentioned. Uh, but I think, um, in, you know, I think looking back at, uh, at my own background where I was working as an engineer before, right, I graduated as, an, as a mining engineering student, uh, you know, worked as an engineer for a few years. And during the entire time we were doing with the 18, I think that's the kind of story that I want to replicate to show that you don't necessarily have to be a full-time activist, a full-time NGO person, a full-time politician in order to create the impact that's needed, or to have the right conversations, right? Every one of us can have our role to play, right? Even if you're working a corporate job, even if you're working in government, you're working in any sector it is, you can have a role. And I think that's, that's the kind of conversation that, that I do want to share with uh, everyone today also. So um, uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Tarma. And um, yeah, you mentioned about like um, everyone, even if you have a corporate job, anything you can be involved. Uh, so I'm gonna gonna bring that up slightly later. I've got something to say about that as well. Um, so um, let's start off with um, just what do you think um, of the current leadership uh, of our state, of our nation, in terms of having youth leaders? Um, how is it right now, Kelvin? Maybe we'll start with you. Oh, that's a very important question. And of course, I think you gave a, a, a good depiction of youth representation, especially on the MP level. Uh, in Malaysia, we have 222 members of parliament, but only 12% are considered youth. And this 12% is when you look at 40 years and below. So now with, uh, when, when we were in government, we, we implemented a, a, a change in the interpretation of what youth is to reduce it to 30, young, 30 years old. And, and we believed in that because we wanted to give more opportunity to, to the younger generation. Because this, this younger generation that we see today are, are the most uh, exposed, most uh, hyper-informative generation. So, so we have so much exposure to, I mean, not just news on, on the internet, but social medias and of course the, the mainstream media. So who are we to uh, exclude this whole generation and to put them aside? So I think this is one of the things that we, we tried to push and try to implement. And with that said, um, we need more voices of young people, not just in parliaments, uh, but in state assemblies, in local council, in local leadership, and every layer of leadership. And, and we need to not, not to not to invade this space or, or to take over the space, but to play a symbiotic or a complementary role with uh, the different generations. Because you see, this is our nation. This is our country. Uh, let us build this together. And each and every one of us play a part. And, and I'm saying this uh, of uh, not just being an MP or YB or what, but every single layer. Tama was exactly uh, correct when she said that we want to see people playing their roles in every layers of society. And that's when we will see a holistic and tangible change in our country. Thank you. Um, I like that we're, we're not here to invade. We're not, to, we're not here to drive out the old people in, in politics, right? We're here to actually complement the, uh, the, the actions, the decision-making process. We want to be part of it. Um, we're not opposing them. We want to be part of them, right? Uh, uh, Kira, maybe you have something to say. What do you think of our current state um, of our, the leadership, of youth leadership in our nation? Yeah, I think looking from the outside, uh, one can say that it's actually quite challenging for a young person to break into the ranks, uh, so to say, of political parties. Uh, only, I think one thing that I, I really admire is, for example, uh, Kelvin's party actually in DEP. Many of the young leaders are mentored and uh, they learn leadership 
it through, uh, you know, public service, such as you see many young DD politicians becoming counsellors, they become special officers, political secretaries. This allow young people to experience um, service politics and, you know, and also grassroots engagement before they run for uh, state or uh, federal level uh, uh, members of parliament. In many situation and not just in Malaysia, even around the world, um, young people are expected to, you know, uh, when we, we say young leaders, we somehow expect everyone to be have ambitions of being a minister or being uh, or rising up and being CEOs. But the reality is that, you know, leadership often starts in the work that you do. Uh, and, you know, for, uh, for Malaysian politics, we need more young people understanding that, you know, how the political landscape works in Malaysia. And the reality is that, you know, uh, um, a lot of political, our political parties, because of the way we are structured in terms of like, we have to build coalitions, uh, we have to, you know, friend, friend, you know, we're going to build a government, you must have uh, uh, alliances and things like that. What happens is that, you know, when it comes to important positions, such as ministership position or, um, or, or, or GLC positions, it's often seen as a reward because of who you are or how senior you are. And that's a very, in a way, quite toxic situation to be in because then you don't incentivize the good people to rise up yeah. um, in political, uh, in, in, in politics. I'm always an advocate for the more young people join political parties, the better, no matter which political party you are in, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter because we're not here um, you know, I, I'm not a politician, right? So I'm not here to tell young people who, which, which is the right party or the wrong party to vote for. But you must get yourself involved in some way or another. Otherwise, it's very difficult to break that um, that mindset or even to break that uh, very strict structure that is set upon by, you know, unspoken rules, traditions, or, you know, people saying, this is the way it is, you know, you want to mm. rise up, you have to do this, you have to do that. But if we don't actively take part in it, it's very difficult to dismantle this so-called system that we don't like. So that's what I always want to uh, tell young people. Uh. So I think, well, I'm also not trying to be, you know, a big, um, uh, not putting a dampener on many young people trying to join politics because nothing good is worth, uh, is easy to have, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, I think politics is a, it's a, it's a long journey uh, if you're determined to do it, but it needs to, um, but which is why, it, you know, it needs, uh, people with the right kind of heart, the right kind of mindset to go into it. Otherwise, um, you know, it you you join politics for the wrong reason, right? I remember, I think in the previous panel, I think Kelvin was saying that you know, uh, I know someone was asking the politicians like, is it easy to make money in politics? You know, someone young asking that, and you know, it's actually very easy to make money if you if you want to be corrupt, if you want to yeah. take money, it's very easy to make money. But you know, um, being joining politics. Uh, it, it's really about you know the reason that uh, you know the, the 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 desire, the reason, the intention, and uh, and 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 that will be reflected in the impact that you make. So if you make a lot of money, you may have made a huge impact on yourself, but you may not have made a huge impact on the community that you claim to serve. Mm. Um, you know, so I think these are just the question that young people need to keep in mind uh, when they want to consider what does being in politics mean to them? Is it just about proving themselves? Is it about giving back to the community? Is it about focusing on policies? All of these are very valid concerns. And it's just a matter of sorting out which are your priorities. Mm, I like that. And I think the fact that if someone is asking, can you make money in politics? I think that is the general assumption that when you go into politics, you can make money because you can get projects, people will give you kickbacks and stuff like that. So that's the legacy that the, I'm sorry to say, but the older generation has left us because that's what they show to us. Um, and it's kind of sad that people think if you're a politician means you're corrupt. Um, and that's not how it's supposed to be, right? Uh, so that's a whole different story on its own. And I think we can talk about that for the whole day. Um, Tarma, your thoughts on, on what's the current state of youth leadership in our country? Uh, I, I mean, echoing, uh, echoing the, the previous two speakers, Kelvin and Kira, I think uh, it's clear that it's not very good, right? Uh, people do feel very underrepresented. Uh, and I think it's, it's very problematic because people fundamentally feel disempowered, right? People feel apathetic. Uh, I had this question in a previous, uh, in a previous uh, forum where people were saying, oh, maybe we should have only 18 after we can get uh, young people to be more energetic about politics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when they stop being apathetic about politics. But, uh, but for me, it's, it's sort of like, a, like, like you are trying to, um, you are, you're trying to flip the situation. If in order to solve young people not feeling excited about politics, you must allow young people to have more power, more mm -hmm. of a say. There's a reason why people feel apathetic about situations because they feel that even if I say something, even if I join in, I fundamentally have no authority, power, autonomy 
to affect the situation. So I feel yep. that, you know, it's not worth investing my time and energy into this. Yep. I might as well do something else, right? And I think that's the fundamental issue that we have, they are facing here, that you have entire generations that are disenfranchised and it will become even more problematic when people realize and recognize, especially right now in our current situation, that you cannot run away from government and you cannot run away from, you know, uh, from politics. And I think that, that's, that's the, 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 the real problem. And, and I don't know how things will sort of blow up later on if we don't mm. solve this problem now. Because if you can see, even those who are in the private sector, people who have been ignoring politics for decades, right now they realize that, okay, if, I, if whatever a minister decides will determine, will determine if I can eat tomorrow, if my company right. goes bankrupt tomorrow, if I can go to work tomorrow, right? All yep. this is determined by someone in Putrajaya, right? So mm. people absolutely cannot ignore politics for the next one, two years, essentially, right? Because of the crisis that we face, uh, that, that we have in our country right now. So I, I think this is, the, this is the challenge that policies, policymakers must recognize and realize that if we do not change our systems, if we don't rethink how do we involve more young people and change the systems to, to uh, you know, to involve more young people into the decision-making sphere, you will have an entire generation who is currently, you know, apathetic, but that apathy suddenly becomes anger, frustration, mm. and mm. genuine, you know, um, you know, genuine, like, um, you know, sort of feelings of, uh, of wanting to revolt, for example, right? Mm. I think that's something that's very dangerous for the health of a country when people feel that way, right? Uh, and I think we need to avoid that. And honestly, the answer for that is to ensure that young people are properly represented, their voices are heard, and their interests are served. Mm. I like that. And I think um, it's not just in the interest of us, uh, well, as young people, to have our voices heard, to have our decision, you know, like be considered even in, in the political scene. But it's also for the interest of the political parties, for you to stay relevant. You need to engage these people because these are going to be your biggest pool of voters. Um, but how are you going to talk to them if you're on a whole different level, your channel is different already. So you don't talk Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok to them, so they don't actually relate to you. So I think that's also, you know, it's not just because we want to have a voice, but we're also thinking about your survival as a political party. You need to actually have a representation of us. Um, right. Uh, so you mentioned, Tarma, I would just like to go back to what you mentioned earlier. So you have to be, we can be involved in, in having a say in politics, even if you're working, um, even if you're not working or, you know, you have a, your, your own company and all that. But a lot of the impression that we get uh, is if you talk about politics, if we say something that may be opposing the current decision or even supporting, you're just afraid that it might affect your business. It might affect your job, you know, because someone will say, oh, they're going to watch you, you know, and then you cannot get your, your uh, promotion or, you know, you won't get that project anymore. So is, is that a real issue that we're facing right now? I do think uh, I do think that's still a real issue, uh, even though it's much less than the past, right? Um, because I think during the uh, previous era, during, for example, Tun Mahathir's era, where there was extreme draconian kind of rule, and then there was more freedom under Pa'la. So it is Mahathir to a 1.0, right? Uh, then there was a little bit more freedom under Pa'la. Uh, then, of course, uh, with Atasri Najib, there was sort of like he tried freedom at first, then then he, he felt insecure and then he, he pulled back, right? So there was there's all this like sort of like changes in policies. But I do think that over time, thanks to the internet, thanks to social media, that yeah. cultural changes happen uh, to an extent, to an extent. However, for vast majority of people, uh, there, there is this, this feeling that, okay, we are still fearful uh, for, for a few reasons, right? Uh, one is, is a fundamental economic reason, as, as you rightly mentioned, uh, you know, that you're afraid you're not, not going to get contracts and all that. Because firstly, a lot of people in Malaysia, especially economically, are, uh, you know, uh, uh, are government servants, or they, they live their lives as a proxy or as a result of uh, government contracts or government funds, right? So they, they may run uh, NGOs that are that are funded by government. They may run. They may work in GLCs that are the government linked, right? So there is an entire mass ecosystem that is fundamentally economically linked to the government. So they feel okay if I speak up, then my bosses will fire me because there is this political connection. So again, you can't run away from the economics of the situation, right? Fundamentally, democracy and economics is 
tied. And if mm. we cannot free our economic systems and, re and minimize government dominance and control, then we will still have an issue in terms of freedom of speech, in terms of uh, voting in, in a certain way, in terms of trying to reshape our political norms, right? These mm. things are fundamentally tied hand in hand, hand. But also I think um, this is a shifting norm, right? Uh, I think with younger people, people of our generation, right? Um, we do believe that if I speak up on social media, it's okay because this mm. is a medium that government may not be as um, you know as used to control, right? Um, and unlike the mass media stuff, and I think that that has shifted uh, since GE uh, twelve essentially, right? Mm. But I, I do think that for our older generations, they are still very much used to it. And you know, when you have your parents saying, "Okay, uh, Mona, Kelvin, Kira, Tarma, okay, please don't talk about this because <laughs> then you get in trouble," right? So I think uh, I think that sort of cultural upbringing, right, has shaped our understanding for a while. So that will take some time to shift also, right? Uh, but so I think there's two things. One is generational passing. And number two is yeah. that we need to relook our economic systems also to yeah. whether it is wise, it is okay that so much is being controlled by governments or government-linked corporations. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, I was laughing because my mom said exactly that. So she was like, you make sure you don't say anything about this and better you inform your speakers, don't say this thing. That's all like, oh my God. Uh, so that's exactly what she said. Um, okay, I, I like that. Yeah, because it's actually connected, right? Our economy and, and yeah, frankly speaking, a lot of my business as well, you know, we get from, you know, the tourism ministry, for example, or, you know, other ministries or departments. Um, and so we are worried, you know, if we say something, even on social media, you see people are being arrested or being, you know, questioned by the police because of what they tweeted, they put on the on, on their Twitter account. Uh, so that's, a, a, you know, legit fear that we have uh, if we say something. Uh, Kelvin, did you want to say something about, were, were you actually questioned by the police like Said Sade if you said something? Um, to be honest, I am... Uh... I'm more, I'll say I'm more blessed in that sense that the police does not really knock on my door. Yeah. Uh, but then it's not just the police. I mean, there are different worlds that we are dealing with in our jobs as well. I mean, like uh, when we raise up certain issues, for example, certain parties or certain certain quarters may not be happy, for example, in Kuching itself, we have to do the underworld. So when you raise up certain issues, they will come at you and say, you know what, you raise this up again, uh, I cannot guarantee your safety. Or even when I raise up issues of corruption in parliament of a certain individual, um, I get messages and proxies warning me, once you reach in Kuching, you better be careful if you stop, don't stop talking about a certain person. So this is the reality that we lived in. And I, I completely agree with Tarma because this was the whole ecosystem that I grew up in. Mm. I think uh, even when I was growing up, I, I my parents or even people elderly, um, more and more elderly than me always advise that you know what be careful with what we say uh, in Malaysia there is freedom to say something but there's no freedom after the speech and so on and so forth and again I don't blame them because uh, that out of good intentions they come up with advice but the reality is that that kind of put a, a ceiling upon upon young people mm -hmm. uh, spirit of fear of the young people to not actually speak up so actually that was my upbringing the fact of the matter that I didn't really care about politics uh, even all the way up to university until I was 20 plus. So, so, uh, but I had a wahyu or I had a realization <laughs> of perspective change um, due to different things that happened, the injustice, the discrimination, the oppression that happens. And then I made a decision in my heart, you know what, I cannot stand still and mm -hmm. see this happening. And that's where I got myself into it. And that's where I empower young people uh, right now the best that I can. And I think the social media age, and also I said this, this, this age of a hyper uh, information has also played an important role to empower young people. You see, because when we see others doing, making a change, when we see others uh, making a difference mm. wherever they are, this inspires young people. I think this is, this breaks the chain of fear that say, you know what, um, even if, um, uh, um, even if I'm afraid right now, even if uh, the, the situation is bad right now, but I see another person in another country in another state doing something so good, you know what, I can do the same. And so, so one thing that I'm very inspired, and, and this is my general observation right now, in the past, when you arrest one guy uh, for maybe speaking out or something, uh, the rest would just cower. The rest would just yeah. hide in one area. And, and we see it, for example, in Opasi Lalang. A lot of young people, okay, okay, let's not talk about it. But right now, uh, the whole mentality, the whole, the whole culture has changed. You try arresting one of us, we rise yeah. up. 
and this is yeah. this is great and this is i tell you down to to lot works of uh, activists uh, works of ngos to and continue to empower and continue to educate and it's something that I, I i love to see so like we see right now as you mentioned social media's chairman glc's was was questions so i think was questions different people with questions but it's it's like the seeds you try to bury us but we'll grow and we will we will take the street mm. if it wasn't for covid 19 trust me the streets will be filled yeah that's true and and yeah i saw on twitter people are actually donating to those who were you know like um not arrested maybe questioned by the police donating to help them you know get a new phone get the internet i i saw on online so it was really good and that gives us a bit of um strength i would say to voice out our concerns if not it will be like fearful you know my mom even tells me you better don't tweet uh, weird, weird things out on your twitter so i uh, yeah um okay so the next one is quite interesting because um this question is about um our perceived uh, well, it is our Asian culture of respecting our elders. Uh, so sometimes in parliament, people will say, oh, you keep quiet because you're still young, you know, setahun jagong or, you know, things like that. Although that was not a very young person he was uh, talking about. Um, so have you um, had this experience when you were actually bringing up your, um, you know, ideals and your ideas where you told that you're too young to do anything? Kira, maybe in, in your experience, have you had that before? I don't think it has been explicitly said to me mm -hmm. at least. Um, but of course, uh, in society, you have uh, you know people who who you know subtly um, signal to you that you know you're not good enough or you're not, or you're too young, and you know this manifests in 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 uh, in various actions, right? For example, when the government does consultations, um, how many young women are involved in building mm. policies uh, that affects them? Uh, how many youth are involved when it comes to when the Ministry of Youth and Sports are building policies uh, that, that affects them, right? I think one simple example is that, you know, when uh, the Ministry of Women and Community Development, when they form policies on child protection, on things like that, how many children are actually being consulted in the process? I think these are great ways to just highlight how, um, you know, why representation is important. And of course, you don't want children to be MPs. That's not the point. Right. But the point is, when it comes to making decisions on behalf of others, especially in marginalized communities, they need to be uh, involved in the policy making process. And that's something that we often try to advocate for within Undi 18, either by giving them a platform in mass media or giving them, mm. uh, you know, uh, giving them capacity buildings and technical skills for them to run their own campaigns. So when Undi 18 launched Undi Sabah, Undi Sarawak, almost um, one year ago, almost one year ago, you know, um, ever since then, uh, you know, we run monthly workshops, we organize webinars, forums, uh, we get them to engage with politicians, um, both Sabah, Sarawak and here in Semenanjo, we address issues of representation, uh, MA63, uh, political funding, and so on and so forth. That to this day, if the mass media wants to interview a young Sarawak and a young Sabahan, they will go to Undi Sabah and Undi Sarawak. And that's what representation is about. And that's what us as someone who, uh, people or institutions, you know, have a responsibility to do. We have to provide the platform for, um, you know, uh, uh, for communities to speak up. And I think, um, you know, in the context of when it comes to looking at the different identity that we have as a Malaysian, yes, I grew up in Sarawak, right? I grew up in Niri, but I am not from Sarawak. I mean, I mean, I'm not Sarawakian. So when media come to me and ask me for comments, I'll be like, okay, I'm not the best person for you to reach out. You must speak to my only Sarawak counterparts um, because they are the ones going through uh, the lived experiences. You know, what does it mean to have, let's say, um, uh, uh, state elections coming up soon in COVID. What do young people think? You know, their voices are extremely important, and we have a responsibility as, um, you know, as media, as politicians, as government to uh, to platform them. So for me, that's what um, uh, I think people should focus on, right? Because uh, while you know, I mean, I, I of course it's it's nowadays people don't do not say. I don't think. People often say, like, oh, you know, you are too young, unless you are Aziz Rahim, who will say that in parliament to Sadiq, <laughs> right? But in reality, uh, microaggressions are much worse, right? Uh, when you organize events, when you do panels and forums and meetings, um, you know, well, it's one thing to celebrate who is are being invited, but we need to also analyze who's not being invited to these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important um, aspect that people don't often take a look at. Um, talking about uh, being, you know, mentioned as, as a young person or being commented in parliament, uh, mm -hmm. Kelvin, have you had that experience before? <laughs> um, yeah. 
many. Actually, the first time I stood up in parliament in 2018, uh, I could, of course, the microphones wasn't on in the other side, but I could hear very clearly people say, "Ay, apa anak muda apa you tahu lah, belajar dulu baru berdiri membahas and everything." And then uh, actually, um, there was a I had a I wouldn't say altercation. I would say maybe, a, and I wouldn't say an argument, but there was like a like a ongoing talk between me and the famous Pase Salak. Uh, Tajudin uh, regarding um, something he 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 makes you make fun of me. He say you anak muda, you sangka you hebat lah, and he say you sangka anak muda sekarang tahu thing they know everything lah, the bar their hearts are and everything. <laughs> and he asked me, do you know what Nelayan Darat is? And then uh, I I I I I knew what Nelayan Darat is, but I didn't want to give him the the treasure. But I said that at the end of the day, are you looking down? Are you talking so condescending towards young people? And the fact is that that represents that whole old mentality that young people do not deserve a role. So again, as I said, um, it was challenging for me. Uh, imagine Sadiq as a minister, uh, being the youngest minister, people to question him. So so I, I knew Sadiq before I was uh, before we joined politics and I was concerned for him actually. I shared my concern with him. I said, I Sadiq, I believe in you. I know you can do great things. Uh, my concern is once you're tr trust into the ministerial position, uh, full limelight will be on you and everybody is especially a lot of people are hoping that you will fail and I don't want to see that of you as a friend so I said I will support you in what you do but I say be careful and be wise in, in all the things that you do mm. so that's the environment that we grew up in parliament there's that time there was only three of us that were maybe considered young there's Prabha from Batu mm. Sade, and then, then there was me uh, now uh, Sandakan uh, after, after the by-election she's in so we are the slightly younger ones uh, in the whole bunch uh, but with that said, I think uh, uh, much actually has changed since 2018 to now. I see there's a shift in, in even, even some of the mindset of the different politicians. Even MPs from the other side uh, are starting to say, you know what, um, uh, we need to give role to the young people. And only 18 played a huge role in that because they start to see the rise of the young people. They start to see the rise of especially um, Mahasiswas, uh, um, uh, university students coming up to speak on important issues. So. Uh, it's a good move and, and a lot of credit goes to Kira and Tama for pushing that, that movement. So yeah. Wow, yeah, that's great to know actually. And that's very encouraging for us um, to know that we will eventually have a voice and will be heard. Um, and in fact, those that, that that voice will be heard and will be taken action on. You know, it's not just hearing and not doing anything. Um, now I think uh, I'd like to touch on the reason why we are this way and also why this culture of um, not wanting to go against your elders is that perhaps maybe uh, our education system perhaps it also taught us not to question too much you know the system uh, or you don't know what you're talking about just follow like you know it's been done before already that has been how it is um, so our education system is teaching us to be book smart, but not to be thinking people. We're not critical thinking. Um, and even if we question, it looks like you're being kurang aja, you know, like because it's not because you're kurang aja, you just want to know more, but then it makes you look like it. So you, you grow up not questioning things. Do you think um, that's one of the reasons, Tarma, you had um, good input on education, maybe you'd like to answer this one. You're, you're talking about uh, kurang aja. I, I, I recall this... Uh, this poem by uh, Usman Awang and yeah. uh, it goes something like this uh, suatu bangsa tidak menjadi besar tanpa memiliki sifat kurang ajar mm. so um, uh, 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 you know uh, a community a nation cannot become great without being willing to be kurang ajar right so I think that's something that we must realize and recognize uh, in this country and not fear right uh, so that sifat kurang ajar to challenge authority to challenge established ideology, to challenge status quo. I think that is what more people need because fundamentally in life, because humans are flawed, right? It doesn't matter our generation, our parents' generation, it doesn't matter whoever it is, we are fundamentally flawed. And when flawed human beings create ideologies, create systems, you know, create uh, certain established structures, there will always be, be flaws, right? There will always be problems, right? This is fundamental, uh, a part of human experience. So I think that um, being willing to call out, to challenge, to think critically and push back upon these sort of flawed ideas and flawed established systems, I think is so important. Uh, so talking about our education system, I do think that that is a, you know, that is a deeply, um, you know, a deeply established problem where essentially we uh, we stop students from challenging them, uh, challenging um, teachers in classes, right? We disencourage people and we say, okay, belajar sekadar, okay, untuk exam, Belajar mm. untuk lulus, belajar untuk dapat A, 
cukup, right? No need to ask yeah. more more than that, right? But and I think this is this is the issue with how we've structured our system. But uh, when you look at how countries like, for example, uh, the US have done it, um, and I think there are many other countries who have done different systems where there are certain subjects where you know you sit down, you listen, and you get things done. Like for example, mathematics, right? You yeah. can't I can't debate at maths. <laughs> Right, yeah. uh, I can't debate dy dx differential right, <laughs> equations, right? Um, but when it comes to things such as morals, when it comes to things such as language, right, there should and there has to be more room for interpretation, for argument, for experimentation, and that's essentially what we are not doing right now. We teach people peribasa, but we don't talk about the the context and the spirit behind the peribasa, right? Why is it that you know, for example, Usman Awang, why did he say these kind of words, right? Why is it that the Muniti culture, uh, what was the, the cultural context that made them think about um, why they, you know, why they believe in 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 or why they came up with that. Uh, with that pronoun or that peribahasa in the first place, right? So I think this is the fundamental problem where we look at the road learning system to make sure that we are good at exams, but we're not good at life, right? We're not good at, we're not creating people who are ready to challenge the world. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I do think this is a lot, a lot of it is, is going back to uh, the politicization of the system, right? Where we want to create people that are more docile, that are more, you know, less questioning. I do think that this is fundamentally part of that. So again, if we want Malaysia to become great, we must be willing to create a generation that is kurang ajar. I like that. And I think I'm going to use that as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to look it up, Usman Awang, on that. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Although I'm not encouraging people to become kurang aja, you know, you could, but, you know, within reasons, lah, okay, don't go kurang aja everywhere. Um, when you said about politicizing the system, the education system, um, earlier on, we talked about, you know, the vernacular schools. Do you think, um, you know, that is something that is actually segregating people even more and and perhaps that actually makes our leaders want to work on those segregation and because of that you know they, they're it's like a divide and rule kind of thing so they want to get support from the malays they will just say oh you know if you don't protect your own rights malay rights and all that you're going to fail you're not going to be in power and stuff like that is that part because of our education system what do you think kelvin do you do you have any comments on this well, I'll throw the tough one at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I fully agree with uh, what Tama is saying. And I, I, I didn't know about that that uh, saying by Usman Awang, but it captures, I think, the essence of, mm. of what we need to challenge uh, the new generation. With, with not being kurang aja per se, I think there is always a way to put forth our thoughts, our opinions, and our views on things in a constructive manner rather than just being loud and, and intrusive. Uh, because I think there's a lot of wisdom in how we push forward uh, a lot of our thoughts. But I think the education system in Malaysia, um, of course, there's this big argument of is vernacular schools uh, relevant? Is vernacular schools a uh, hindrance towards national unity? Uh, in my view, again, this is in my view, uh, if we wanted to stamp out vernacular schools, we should have done it right at the beginning. Mm. That means right before, I mean, we mencapai kemerdekaan and everything. But the fact that now it has grown, over 50 years and then um, there was so much so much culture so much history so much people growing up with it to stem it right now it would be a bit difficult um, but with that said it does not mean that it's the end of the world but how do we turn this whole situation for the good uh, we cannot see vernacular schools purely on a lens of race or a certain culture fact of the matter is a lot of different races a lot of different people of different cultures go into and get educated in vernacular schools but we should change the whole education system, how both national schools and vernacular schools uh, teach about national integration, teach about the importance in diversity of language, diversity of culture, diversity of, uh, of, of progressive thinking. And I think that's what's lacking in, in Malaysia. Fact of the matter is our education system is, is pushing us, uh, when I grew up, when I grew up, especially in schools, uh, the perception is the more questions you ask, the dumber you are. Mm. And that and that's the wrong message that we have to we, we are putting forth because the fact of the matter is uh, to understand to get a, a student interested and engaged in a, in a in a topic we should encourage them to ask more questions. The fact of the matter is questions will determine the person's understanding of the matter. And 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 I tell you, I I experience, I had the privilege of going overseas to study. So I I realized that that why are my why are my peers from different countries performing better in certain things that I do? I mean, we Malaysians, we are the best in written exams. You give us a test paper, you give us something, we, are the, we score the best, but you give us a presentation, 
a, a critical thinking uh, uh, assignment and somehow we are uh, we, we cannot translate what we know on paper into that and, and that that got me thinking and I realized that a lot of people uh, students overseas students asking questions in 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 uh, in, in lectures and stuff like that. Like, wow, wow, there's so many questions to ask. Uh. You know, in Malaysia, it's like, uh, us, teacher asks, uh, uh, any, any questions? Like, even though we don't don't know what is going on, we have no ideas going on, that, 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 no questions. Because we, we are afraid of looking stupid. We're afraid of looking, uh, uh, not, not knowing the thing. But the matter is, we, sh we should shift this whole perception. We should encourage people, you know what? Ask questions and that, and we, we will encourage you uh, we will we'll give you honor. We we'll honor you for asking questions, and this is something that we we need to change within our education system. Not so um, exam orientated, uh, but empower mm. orientated. Because I believe that uh, what is even more important is how we translate what we learn into what we do in real life, and 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 that's uh, in, in instilling values and principles. So so when we were in government, we tried to. Uh, shift a little bit. I think one of the things, one of the important things that I think Dr. Masley did at the time was to, to amend Aoku, uh, to, mm. give, to give powers to the Mahasiswas to be part of, uh, of um, uh, I, mean, I mean, be part of the whole political process. Uh, before that, of course, after, under Tun Mahade 1.0, uh, Aoku was amended. Um, and then, uh, again, I give him the benefit of the doubt. I, I don't think he is like trying to suppress and everything consciously but if that was the the the, the thinking in those days are uh, you belajar you belajar dulu you focus dulu you jangan question everything mm. then only you go up there so again i get uh, i may be wrong but i give him the benefit of the doubt in these times but then that the world has changed right now so that whole concept or that whole thinking is is different we sh we, we are not building a generation of robots we're not building a generation that would just fits in the office and 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 go on on, on, on on daily, I mean, what, what, what they're supposed to do, but a generation that thinks out of the box because the world is changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, jobs of those days and jobs of today is whole different. And, and how do we prepare our young people? I think the biggest questions education uh, uh, needs to address is how are we preparing our young people for, for jobs of the future and to be men of the future, men and women of the future. I think this is something mm -hmm. that we need to, uh, um, to look at. Amazing. Yeah, I like that we're not um, building a generation of robots. We're all thinking, uh, feeling people, and we need to address that. And, and talking about um, more young people, you know, working, uh, being in the workforce, we also have more women in the workforce and more women probably in politics as well. Um, and, and how do you see that happening right now, Kira? What's the progress on that having more um, equality, I would say, for women? I think we are still very far behind. Um, and I think, uh, and this was a problem, right, even though we had changed governments, um, you know, and again, this is what I go back to my earlier point about uh, coalition politics, you know, even though before elections, uh, PH had promised for 30% women representation, but because it's coalition politics, it's very difficult to appoint um, you know, more women into positions of power because uh, positions are seen as reward. That's why you see somehow um, people who are not so competent holding a very important position. So when, you know, you, we, how do we make the argument that there are no qualified women out there to take that position, right? Um, so I think when it comes to politics, women are still quite far behind because uh, if our political leadership don't see women representation or the lack of women representation as a problem, we will never be able to change this cycle or this culture where women are, uh, you know, assigned to women's wings, uh, and they do not see a. There's no clear pathway for them to become party leaders uh, within oh. their own uh, parties. And why this is important, and why we need to pressure political parties to change this, is that because political parties are the one that are trying to win elections. You know, mm. there used to be, um, there is a, there is a, you know, there's a runaway joke that says that, you know, whoever wins back then, right, whoever wins the UMNO uh, elections will become prime minister. So which elections is more important, party elections or general elections, right? So I'm not saying either or elections is no less or more important, but because of the system we are in, political party leaders play a very huge role in determining how um, minority groups uh, rise up within uh, the political sphere because if you are not able to rise up with a political party it's very difficult for you to rise in elect during elections because um, you know how candidates win is, is, is through how their political parties rally behind them either provide monetary or grassroots support you know mobilizing volunteers and all of that so um, you know if 
I don't I don't know if anyone has done a, a in depth research about this, but if could we take a look at you know how much political parties invest in women candidates compared to male candidates, I think we may be able to see a huge differences in terms of uh, the investment that political parties put in. And why do I mention investment is that politics, um, you know, for good or for worse, it's it's about money, right? And yeah. money is not just about corruption, but it's about investment, it's about development. Um, you know, do political parties have coaching programs for young women to learn from senior mentors, you know? Uh, do, 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 do political parties instill a system whereby, you know, both men and women, uh, young men and young women have an equal level of uh, learning opportunities when it comes to um, uh, uh, building themselves as uh, politicians, right? Uh, so I've been in, uh, you know, I've been on, on the side where we organize multiple programs uh, for capacity building for the public. And we always see a huge percentage of uh, male participants. And yet a lot of female participants would message us and say, hey, um, I'm not confident enough to be a participant. Can I just observe? Can I just watch? Can I just be an audience? But yet you don't see this kind of um, self-doubt among male participants. They would just apply whether they, they get or don't get, they don't care, they just apply. So, you know, culturally, there is a difference in terms of um, how we perceive ourselves as, uh, as men and women, as boys and girls. And this is not a problem only within the political sphere. But my uh, contention, my challenge to political parties that this is a problem that political parties can overcome if you consciously think about it. You know, we cannot just blame young uh, you know, girls for not stepping up. We cannot just blame women for not coming forward um, if you don't look at the bigger picture, you know. However, because historically, you see women playing a big role in political movement and political parties. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, and even now, the Kaum Ibu in Amno is a huge mover at grassroots politics. These are women that go door to door and campaign, uh, you know, and campaign mm. for their party. Um, and I think also, especially in Sarawakian politics, right, many, um, in, I think uh, one of my Sarawakian campaigners told me, interestingly enough, you observe, many of the female leaders often take the position of their deceased husband or father, you know, especially in historical, if you look at histor historically, right? So, it's very interesting that when given the opportunities, women can step up. When given the platform, women can lead, women can rule, women can set policies. And yet, we are still not seen as first choice or we are not seen mm. equally when it comes to uh, de a decision to uh, you know, promote someone or decision to, okay, if I want to chalonkan person A, person B, um, how you know do, do these factors come into mind for political leaders? Because at the end of the day, also, pencalonan depends on you know, the party leadership and all that. So I think um, similar to education, uh, you know, uh, sexism in po po politics and party politics need to have multi-pronged -pro approach and you need to have multiple solutions instead of just saying, okay, um, next year, we just put 50% women because mm. that's our promise, you know, because that's not fair either to young women who did not receive coaching or support uh, before you throw them out in the field, right? Um, so, you know, support needs to be given at all levels and not just uh, being used as a, as a party, as the election promise or, um, you know, or, or as, you know, a, a virtue signaling, right? Telling them, oh, you know, we, we have X, 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 Y, Z uh, number of women politicians. Mm. Um, uh, there you go, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do have women in, in, in party uh, programs, right? They do the program mm. planning, they do this thing like that, but they're not visible. So that's not right either, yeah. Mm. So I think uh, one of the campaign that Undi think is running, the Triple One Initiative, aims to uh, promote 50% women representation in parliament, is advocating for this specific solution instead. Instead of just pushing for a quota, we believe that you need to instill cultural change first, um, or at the same time in pushing for uh, representation. You know, you can't just demand for representation, but we don't provide solution uh, for young women uh, to level the playing field. You know, quotas are not a solution to everything. Um, but it is a good first step. However, party leadership, especially uh, party politics, needs to keep in mind that diversity is not just um, a PR stunt, but also an investment into young women within your party to make sure that when the time comes to decide who is going to dicalonkan, you know, you have a good pool of candidates to choose from, mm. not just um, people that, uh, you know, you see often because they're active and things like that. Mm. And I guess we also don't want it to be just a, a, 
uh, an act of filling a quota, you know, and Correct. not thinking exactly. about merits, um, whether the person is actually the best candidate, just because we don't have enough women, okay, we just put this one person to fulfill, you know, the quota. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's not the, the solution. It's a good first step, but there's a lot of things that we need to do uh, leading towards that. Talking about inequality, and, and this is uh, on, on sex inequality, but how about gender? And maybe, Tarma, would you like to talk about uh, sorry, not gender, um, race. Uh, yeah, I got that confused. Um, on, on race equality, and I think um, now we see a lot of uh, racial discussions, I would say, in Malaysia. There's a lot of uh, things going on, um, especially in West Malaysia. We're a bit luckier here, I think, in Sarawak, where we work slightly better with each other. Um, so from your point of view, uh, yeah, what have you got to say about um, racial equality? Okay, I, I, can't, I can't comment about the Sarawak side. I think uh, Kelvin and Kira might be more familiar with that. Um, so I'll, I'll stick to the, to the West Malaysian uh, yeah. perspective of things. I, I do think that um, it is fundamentally um, a, a big problem, right? Uh, in mm. terms of how, we, how we've uh, developed society, how we've developed this nation, right? And I think going back to our conversation uh, earlier that uh, Kelvin was talking about vernacular schools and that question and all that, right? But I, I do think that it is a bigger question about how we, you know, how do we live with each other? Do we just live in completely separate boxes, right? Uh, and, and is our society designed that way, right? Um, because it is, you know, while the British had a pecah dan perintah kind of system, mm. but uh, I do think that essentially we are um, carrying on with that, with that manner, right? Where uh, a, lot of, a lot of the Malay communities are government linked. Or, or, or lived in, uh, you know, government-supported ecosystems, right? Chinese have their entire uh, separate ecosystems, while uh, while more privileged Indians are able to live in more urban centers. But then the, the non-privileged Indians really don't have any ecosystem to rely on at all, right? Um, and I, I think this is, I mean, uh, speaking as a as an Indian person, right, and and looking at uh, the kind of um, issues that the Indian community are facing: high rates of gangsterism, high rates of criminality. Uh, and also high deaths in police custody, right? Um, and it is fundamentally an issue where there is a lack of resources, right? Uh, where, um, where there is a disparity in, in terms of the amount of uh, investment into these different communities. Like for example, uh, on a yearly basis, the Indian community gets like a hundred million um, per year for the entire community's development. Uh, 100 million, that's it. Uh, and even that is channeled through SEDIC, or, or Mitra or whichever uh, government agency, which often has a lot of, uh, you know, has a lot of, uh, uh, I, I, don't know, okay, I don't know what's a politically correct word for it, but essentially there are a lot of holes, right, in terms of the, the disbursement. Uh, but, and, and again, so how much of that actually reaches the community? So already the, the amount of money for development is very small, right? And then there's a lot of, you know, leakages through political cronies, politically interested parties. So how much really goes to the ground uh, in the end? So I think this is a whole issue that we have right now, which is why for me, I, I think, again, one of the things that we have to do as society is to rethink and relook at, are our systems and institutions um, right? You know, because while we've had the NEP, and, and I think the NEP has done a great job in sort of reducing the disparity of wealth between races, right? But, uh, but is uh, like are our current systems you know due for a rethinking and realignment right in terms of looking at disparity of wealth income and access within race itself right because we look at uh, how extremely wealthy malays for example have all the power in the world while a lot of you know average um, b40 malays feel very disempowered right that's with the malay community but also between races Right, how um, the Indian community, especially those who are extremely poor, are victims of violence, victims of a lack of opportunities, where they have to resort to crime uh, because that's really the only option that's there, right? So that has a, an immediate harm to the rest of Malaysia. When you don't invest in one community, that is an immediate impact. So I do think that when you live in a country together, um, you know, when you want to build a shared future together and you want people to invest in this country uh, as one, it means that you know we must think as a whole of society instead of racializing ourselves and 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 you know and boxing ourselves apart, which I think is is what's going on right now. So um, to answer, uh, I guess your question, I, I do think that race is a huge problem still, uh, mm -hmm. especially in West Malaysia, um, and uh, and you know we've had we we have a long way to go before mm -hmm. we can even start addressing it. And let's not even talk about the political aspect, right? Uh, where 
um, Indian politicians have little to no say uh, within mm. a lot of systems, right? And I think that's that's really the the, the problem that we have uh, at the moment, and and we really need to solve that. Mm. Um, yeah, that's interesting that you brought up the topic about uh, leakages or you know holes. You call them, I would call them corruption outright. Uh, so if if we're talking about corruption, which is a really serious um, issue right now, it's like um, I, I don't know. It's just something I don't know even where to start because it's just everywhere. Uh, so if you know, I think a lot of young leaders would want to talk about it. But um, they're just afraid because, you know, like, uh, you know, MACC, you know, like they want to complain. Uh, am I going to be, you know, like um, red paint will be splashed on my door or something like that. So how do they actually, um, and in fact, this goes on to one of the questions that I'm getting and, and one also of my own question. How do you actually get young people to raise, uh, I would say, sensitive issues? But these are actually very, very legit uh uh, issues that need to be discussed. Corruption is going to affect all of us, you know. So, um, like you said, that there's so amount of uh, funds maybe allocated to build this road, but because of corruption, the road is not built well, and people go on accidents. You've got, you know, like potholes and stuff like that. So it actually kills people. You know, if you you look at it the long uh, the long term, you actually kill people. Corruption. So how do we actually address this issue as a young leader? Because then you're gonna get in trouble, you know. Because that's a very, very sensitive thing to say. Um, so how do we go about it, Kelvin? Maybe you've got experience on this. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's very, it's a very difficult issue, and I think that is where we need to encourage people to think beyond. Um, just, I mean, don't, don't see see corruption as an issue that really affects each and every one of us. I think I think uh, I think Kama at right at the beginning said this before that a lot of people do not want to be part of politics because they do not see uh, how it affects them. Mm. I think I mean I mean I can give you a good example in the twenty before the twenty eighteen elections with the whole scandal of the one MDB and stuff like that, and when we talk about billions and billions of uh, mm. uh, alleged corruption and alleged loss. But somehow it is not really felt on the ground, and because people do not yeah. do not see the link, people do not see how does it affect them. Uh, people say that uh, people have a perception that even, for example, politics has has is like in another different echo chamber from their life itself. They do not see the connections between how it affects them. So I think this is why uh, voters' education is so important. This is where empowerment is so important to let people understand that they are big issues. There are policy issues that we need to address that will make our life better. And that's what actually politics is all about. Um, I, I, I have this mantra which I go everywhere and I say this. I say that uh, I have this personal mission of making politics boring again uh, because uh, that's what it is supposed to be. Politics is not about drama, not about scandals, not about videotapes and, and so on and so forth, but it's about policies that change life policies that bring people from where they are to what they can be and as a country as a whole. So that's where focus should be at. And I believe that that starts with the young people and, and young people should be focused. I mean, let's, we cannot deny that race, racial or religious politics will be there. Uh, but how do we cut through that noise and bring the voice of reason, bring the voice of, of policy discussions into the main conversation? how all these issues affect us, how all these issues actually limits us rather than protect us. Because it's so easy to play on sentiments. Race and religious mm. sentiments uh, will always capture headlines because psychologically, that's how we humans are trained to think per se. Uh, if we feel threatened, we, we go back in our own cave uh, with people that we feel comfortable with and generally it's always with the same race or the same religion and stuff and stuff, so and so forth. But how do we uh, translate messages that goes beyond these lines? Like, you know what? Um, poverty affects everybody regardless of race. Corruption affects everybody regardless of race. Educational issues affects everybody. And until we address the core issue rather than the race or religious issue, or even region issue, it's not just about mm -hmm. race, religion, it's about region, where you come from and so forth. Uh, let's not package it. It's, it's for me, it's identity politics as the same. Uh, but how do we address policies on, on a holistic level and, and change the life of people. So uh, I challenge that to young people. Everything, um, you cannot say I don't care about politics because uh, politics mm -hmm. care about you. Um, everything is politics. The moment you wake up from the bed, uh, you go to work, that's politics. Which school you want to go to is mm -hmm. politics. Which girlfriend, which boyfriend you want to find is politics. 
and that's the reality of it. And uh, I mean, even marrying and uh, all this uh, politics, this is all involves policy. So how do we get that conversation across to every single one to think about not just short term, short term gains, what I, do I get in terms of uh, what can you offer me, but what mm. long term? Um, what if a country prosper? How would this involve me? What if there is, mm. how does this affect me? I think this is the mm. message. Difficult, but we need to uh, push forth. So let's make politics boring again. Yeah, I like that. Let's make politics boring again. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's interesting that you mentioned um, politics uh, care about you, uh, even though you don't care, you think you don't care about politics. And in fact, um, I think also this is uh, maybe part of the legacy from the older generation. They'll tell you, um, you know, don't get involved, like, just focus on what you're doing. Um, even myself, when I ask, uh, you know, like my mentors, you know, like what should I do about all these issues? Can I voice it out? I say, I just focus on your business la, later, you know, your business will be affected. But it is affecting my business already. So you see, I am actually doing something because of my business and that's why I want to voice it out. Uh, although whether it will affect my business further or not, that's a different question. Um, so this is actually a question, I think we're getting it from YouTube and also part of our closing question. Um, if a, a young person wanted to go and voice out their concerns or want to go even, you know, like um, be in a leadership position to have their say, um, how would they approach this uh, in this current situation that we have? What are the first few steps that they should take? Um, Kira, maybe from your point of view. I think the first step we should take is uh, looking at a situation around you and asking questions. I think, you know, Kelvin was right earlier. You know, that was how I started in politics, uh, political advocacy at least, right? I looked around my uh, environment and I was like, how come American youth are so loud and just so active and so passionate about issues, but I didn't see the same for my own peers when I was in univers uh, uh, university in Malaysia. I went to a private university before I went, went to the US. So then I was like, okay, you know what? It's because young people did not have the right to vote and I want to change the situation from them, uh, for them. So that was how my inspiration started and that was how I begin to take action because I asked so many questions that I got angry not having the answers that I wanted that I realized, okay, I need to do something about this. And that is why I went into political advocacy. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And Tarma, how about you? What do you think? What are the first few steps? Uh, I think the first few steps, uh, the most important is to realize and recognize that politics is not only, as I mentioned earlier, not only for politicians, not only for activists, not only for select NGO people, right? Politics is for everyone because it affects all of us and all of us have a say. That's the first part. Uh, second thing is to realize that you don't have to do this full time in order to have a say and to have an impact, right? I think uh, Undi 18 is proof that, uh, that even if you do things as a passion project, if you do it consistently, you believe it enough and you work, uh, you work hard at it, right? Uh, you are able to create some level of change, some level of impact within the community, and who knows, even even the country. I think that that ability to dream and to uh, and to fight for things, I think that's something that's so important. Um, but I also think that um, NGOs like us, like youth NGOs, we also have an important role to play to bring these conversations to more Malaysian youth, right? Uh, to change things culturally, because I think we we can all agree that uh, there are deficiencies within the education system in terms of how people are being culturalized within mm. classrooms, right? Uh, and I, I think Kira rightly, rightly spoke about it, right? That it's how you culturalize classrooms that create the people that, um, or, or, de or mm. develop societies after the classrooms end, uh, which we are failing right now. So how do we step in when government policies are mm. failed, right? That's a question that we must ask ourselves as mm. private sector people, people outside government, people who are in, uh, in the NGOC. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. And um, last but not least, Kelvin, just to wrap things up, um, how do, should we go if we want to go into politics or we want to have a voice at least? The fact of the matter is everybody is in politics. And I agree that whether Thomas said you don't have to be an elected representative, but everything you say or stand that you make is part of politics in itself. Politics in the beginning has, has got a bad rap. You mentioned politics in Malaysia, a lot of people that only throw. But the fact of the matter, in its pure essence, it is good. So everybody can be part of it. My first advice is find something that captures your heart. What are you passionate mm. about? What do you want to change? And everybody is different. And it does not make you less or more than another person who has a different dream, a different vision, or a different passion. So find that passion that you have. 
find somebody that shares that passion as a group. Imagine the things that you can do. So um, be part of that. Join either an NGO or if you want, if you want to be in frontline politics, find an MP, find an Adun, find somebody that can mentor you through it. Find, get a clear, uh, develop your political principles or your political values before joining your party. And this is what, what I did. I make sure that my my political values was firmed up. Then I find a party that is closer to what I believe in. There is no perfect political party. Rather than join a party and be formulated by their policies after. Mm. So I, again, as I said, young people read more. Uh, empower yourself. Make sure that when we speak, we speak with substance, not just with a loud voice. And uh, find ways to co- to symbiotically uh, complement. Uh, the older generation of their wisdom and also maybe their experience. And I think with that, uh, we take the first move. And uh, I think I think that's that's it. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, uh, and I would like to actually just repeat that we're not here to replace the whole older generation. We are here to work with them symbiotically, like what Kelvin said. Uh, so with that, I think, Tarma and Kira, you've got another meeting that you've got to run to. Um, and yes, we also, you so much. No worries. We're also running out of time. We try to keep it short. So to you audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, watch out for the next one. I hope by then we'll be out of MCO. But if we have to be still in MCO, um, then so be it. We need to flatten the curve. So in the meantime, please stay safe, everyone. And thank you so much to all the speakers for willing to share uh, their thoughts with us today. And until then, uh, have a good week ahead. See you, everyone. Thank Thank you. you. See you.